I'm here with Joe Ballou. She's uh, Chief Information Security Officer at KPN. Joe, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. So we're going to talk about the Internet of Things and how that's developing. First of all, KPN's got a lot of customers, enterprise customers and consumer customers. Yeah. To what extent are they embracing the Internet of Things? Um, well, I think that they are uh, actively embracing it because simply at this moment they don't know the difference uh, anymore between something that they're choosing to buy and something that they buy inadvertently. Because I think we need to stop thinking of the Internet of Things as, you know, a, uh, a something with a computer in it. Right. It's not a something with a computer in it. Everything is a computer and it may have other things. So your computer may also have a toasting functionality or your computer may be a smartphone or your computer can have four wheels and it's a car. But it's fundamentally always a computer. And I think in the next 10 years, we're not going to buy things unless they're connected to the internet. Right. There won't be a choice between a regular fridge and a smart, there'll only be this option of the computerized thing, which also cools. So it's happening by default, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about a little bit of the benefits of that. First of all, for businesses, what, what's, the, what's the low hanging fruit? Well, I think, you know, there are some, uh, certainly some really wonderful ideas of cutting costs by having better choices made that are energy efficient, that optimize certain business processes, uh, that could potentially also provide a higher level of security and comfort. And even, you know, when it comes to, from a business perspective to the health of your employees, it can also have those kinds of value propositions. So there is quite a bit of value to be gotten. I think that we need to reap that technology's fruits without necessarily being uh, downfalled by the seeds. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of consumers, mm. um, I mean, uh, they could go many ways, connected cars, wearables, etc. What particularly excites you as, as a consumer and uh, as KPN? So I, as a consumer, I, I actually have a wearable, okay. and um, it is connected. And what's really scary is that there are entire ecosystems built around consumers. So it's not enough to have a, a Fitbit, you know, um, which is probably hackable because it's running over Bluetooth. But, um, but it's also connected to your smart home scale. So they have a whole line of things that are connected to each other. And the clue is that they will be talking to each other independent of dealing with me. Right. And I find that actually quite a compelling thing to understand at what point is the user aware about the communication between your toaster, your fridge, and your car. Because uh, they're anticipating your needs. Because they're anticipating your needs. OK, by yeah. like having a really good assistant. Yes. The question is, do you always want one? Because usually when we, when we picture these types of assistants, it's dystopic. Yeah. You know, it's Hal on board the spaceship which, who decides we don't need you anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so let's talk about some of the, the new technologies out there. So KPN's got looking at the low power wide area um, uh, networks and uh, systems. Um, how big an opportunity is that? Well, it's, you know, I, I genuinely think this is the way to go. So if you, if you think about where LoRa comes from, it comes from a very genuine need to be able to con connect metropolitan devices. Mm. So we have Bluetooth for the short range for yeah. 30 meters. We have Wi-Fi for 100 meters. When you go past 100 meters, you need a protocol that's going to actually be able to carry that. Mm. And, you know, it can be very power and resource intensive to do these things over uh, full-blown radio. Um, so you want long range radio, which also has the additional benefit that it's not going to be a very intensive in power consumption. So you can place, you know, units out there that can last a span of four or five years mm. and it'll power lights or bridges or, uh, you know, like the sanitation uh, things, you know, when the trash needs collecting. So it has a lot of social benefits. So bringing connectivity to places that wouldn't have had it before. This is yeah, I, th I think the argument is look, we're going to see connections happen anyway. Yeah. And what LoRa allows you to do is have a mechanism where you have the distance possibility. But what I really like about the way that we did LoRa is the security that's embedded mm -hmm. in the design. Because what I should tell you is, when we initially tried to roll out LoRa, uh, we had our ethical hacking team hack it to smithereens. <laughs> and we broke it completely. And so what we did is we took our vendors and we had a very productive discussion about how to improve those security failures uh, before it went live. And we also made sure that uh, protocol weaknesses, which we also found, went back to the LoRa Alliance so that they could improve that as well. And so I have a higher degree of confidence 
connecting those devices on LoRa than I would had they tried to connect on any other medium. Right. Actually, I mean, one of the big concerns about Wi-Fi, particularly in the consumer context, is the security and the potential to hack your toaster or your fridge, etc. So with LoRa or LTEM or some of the other alternatives, it's, are they more secure than you get with Wi-Fi? I think it really depends on the implementation. Right. And there are ways to do the implementation successfully, securely over Wi-Fi, but uh, they're not inherently built into the protocol. Mm. So I think the difference between a Wi-Fi uh, secured IoT ecosystem versus something with LoRa is we have very strong demands for authentication, for provisioning, for updates, and that type of demand criteria set is not available now or not being actively employed in the same extent for Wi-Fi. Okay, so it's more inherent almost. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about the broad responsibility for security within the Internet of Things. I mean, who should take responsibility? Is it the consumer? Is it the end user? Is it, is it the telco? Is it the enterprise? How, I, how do I you love your question because this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Right. Because you ask a question that everyone asks, you know, who should take responsibility? Should it be the end user or the uh, telco? Here's the deal. We didn't build the insecure device. No. <laughs> you know, the telco only provides a network and the poor user, you know, they bought a device at a moment in time. They usually don't have the skill set to determine whether they're buying a lemon or a quality piece of fruit and they have no idea when that thing is going to die. So it shouldn't have to be their responsibility. It should be, in my opinion, the responsibility of the hardware and software vendor community. And here's the deal. The reason that it's a peeve instead of just a minor irritation is because we've actually designed regulation like the Network and Information Security Directive of the EU which holds everyone to account across all sectors except for the hardware and software right. lobby. Right. And that's inexcusable. Yeah, quite. It needs to be end to end. Though. It needs to be end to end. And I'm fine with telcos and healthcare and transport all taking their share of responsibility. I'm fine with it. Mm. However, I think that burden of responsibility should be equally distributed especially to those who created the problem in the first place. I'll fix it, but they created it. Right, okay, fair enough. So uh, let's talk about privacy, uh, which is obviously related to security, but also the need to authenticate people and identify them, etc. This came up in your blockchain uh, presentation earlier. So how do we get the balance right between privacy and authentication stroke identification? Well, I think the question is, what are we actually uh, identifying? Mm -hmm. And what's the authentication that's required there? Again, in LoRa, there are some very uh, strict and specific requirements for that. Right. Um, however, uh, I always say, and I'm not the only one who says it, you can have um, privacy, or, or you can have security without any privacy built in, but you can never have privacy without security built in. Right. So it's impossible to have a system that's fully private without enabling all the security that goes with it. Yeah, got you. So uh, one is dependent on the other, essentially. So in the question of the Internet of Things, how do we ensure that a device or a car or a machine or a crane, et cetera, is who we think it is or is what it should be? Uh, is there an easy way to do that? I mean, particularly if you're not using SIM cards. Um, so uh, SIM cards are great because they provide you a hardware trust point where you can actually say this was what I put there. But there are different types of signature schemes that you can embed into the device initially. And one of the things that you can do is allow the remote device at, you know, when it's initially on to authenticate uh, directly with a sort of control unit. Okay. And that is regardless of what networking protocol you use on top of this. But these are the kinds of feature sets that we should be demanding from the community that makes this. Okay, and just so, just in summary, do you think the security privacy concerns about the Internet of Things are overblown? No, I don't think so. I think the issue is that the inherent lack of design of security and privacy has brought us to the place where we are now, where we're worried about hacked Barbies, you know, but I think that this is a fixable problem. We just need, again, the only place where there's awareness. We shouldn't keep dumping it back to the user right. because I feel that there's an unfair weight that we put on them. We should put the awareness of this back to the makers. Yeah. And if you take a look about the Mirai botnets and how that even happened with the global distributed uh, denial of service against uh, Dyn DNS, and where, you know, we only had a couple of websites that went down, Netflix went down, okay, if it was a really big deal. But when you look at how that occurred and 
um, the ease of which it occurred and can still occur even with the evolution of Mirai, I think what it points to is a general lack of clue. Yeah. The cameras that were hacked for the Mirai botnet, the vendor said, yeah, but they were never supposed to be sold to consumers. These were always supposed to be behind an enterprise firewall. So I think the initial intentions uh, are failing if they're not inherently built in and put through the whole life cycle of the product. Is, is this a problem or a challenge that regulation can solve? Or? I think there is a need for regulation here, especially with the er area of certification. Mm. I just think that sometimes certification um, is more likely to be a pawn of uh, money-making machines by consultancy firms, and it's going to be extremely uh, problematic to small companies who have this burden of paying for a certification. So I, I really think that we need to just get it right from the perspective of uh, let's make sure we have secure design principles built in, that the uh, people who make the stuff take their own measures to do very offensive hacking of their own products before they get hacked. And I find it really inexcusable uh, that you know KPN has to hack the software and hardware uh, of its vendors before it gets placed on our network. Because the clue is that vendor responsibility hasn't been there. So you know, we have to trust but verify. And this is not always an option for smaller companies or for consumers. Mm, quite. That, that brings me neatly to the role of the telco and the, the role of KPN in the Internet of Things. How big a role should KPN take? Well, I think partial taking of that role has already been determined for us by our regulatory okay. community. Uh, we have a duty of care for our users, and this is why we believe it's our mission to make sure that KPN is secure, reliable, but also trusted by customers, partners, and society. We take that very, very seriously. It goes right uh, from the top, from our CEO, all the way to our call centers. And yeah, security and privacy is absolutely part of our corporate mission. And it's part of your value proposition. Absolutely. Customers, et yeah. Okay. And then just finally, let's talk a little bit about how you see the Internet of Things developing over the next four to five years. I mean, I, you said it was going to become almost by default, but do you see a kind of exponential growth? Do you see a nice steady linear line? You know, how do you see it? I think it's already there and we don't even notice. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think that we are far too unaware about the amount of connected devices that we have today. And I think we take a certain amount of functionality for granted. You know, I, I think that we uh, sometimes don't even realize we buy it now. We don't realize that it's already existing in our corporate environments. Um, you know, we, we talked about the ages ago, all the hacks that were happening on infrastructure components at enterprises, um, like the heating uh, ventilation system, uh, the HVAC system, for example, from Target. I, I really think there's not enough of a clue that that possibility is even there, that these things are connected. Um, and that needs to be there first if we want to think about securing uh, them and making the communication private. Mm. It, it seems to me, as you said at the start of the interview, that everything will become connected because people want the data. The manufacturers want the data. Machine learning, artificial intelligence depends on data. So, And frankly, we want to have the optimization. We want to have the results that are tell us you know, when the light should be dimmed. When you take a look at the IoT device evolution perspective, specifically for users, you know, usually users want to have something that provides them an additional amount of comfort. Uh, maybe they also think about security, like you know, monitoring their homes. Um, and we see it, you know, at the health perspective. The health perspective is absolutely not negligible. But when you take that like sort of home consumerist uh, value chain and you apply it towards the enterprise, these are not that dissimilar yeah. because we want to do the same things in the office. Yeah, yeah, no, God, it's all about trust ultimately yeah. and the, the, the positive transformation yeah. of the technology. Yeah. yeah, and I want to challenge you, like, when, think about the ways that we can make our communities healthier, stronger, better, more secure it will also be using IoT. I mm. think that's where we need to be a bit careful uh, because then it's there when you really don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Got you. Okay, very interesting. Jaya, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you.